This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here and today we're all zoologists and we're trying to be the one to find a legendary creature. We're going to be searching all over the land in different places like the desert, uh, maybe we'll get out of that heat and go to the forests and or mountains, maybe we'll be hanging out in the swamps. We're trying to learn from clues of other people as to where this is, putting the puzzle together with deduction. Today we're taking a look at Cryptid. This is a game that's coming out later this year at Essen uh, from Osprey Games. It is uh, for three to five players. Uh, let me show you how it works. I'll see you on the other side. Encrypted, you're all cryptozoologists trying to be the first to discover definitive proof of a cryptid creature in the wilds of North America. Here we have a layout of the board. There's over 50 different layouts that come with the game. Each of them have a card that show you how to lay this out uh, in all the places like this. So this is just one of the 50 plus ways that you can play the game. And so what, you're trying to find which one of these spots is where that cryptid monster is. And the first one to do that will be the winner. Now you can randomly select one of these cards to set up that board as we just showed, uh, but there's plenty of normal slash beginner cards and there's a lot of advanced ones that makes the game even harder. But on the back side of these cards, it has basically the setup for the game because each player is going to get a clue, a secret clue that all the other players are trying to find out. And depending on the amount of players you have, three, four, or five, there'll be certain player colors that will be playing in a three player game. Each of these is a player color, but they also come with their own clue book, and it's going to tell them which clue to look for. For example, if you're playing a three-player game, the player who's playing red, their secret clue will be the number 91. And so we look at their clue book, and we look here, and the red person would secretly look at 91 and see, okay, 91 is their secret clues within two spaces of a bear territory. But you can see there's all different types of clues. There's 96 different clues that a person could possibly have. And by the way, each of the books have the same types of clues, but the numbering is randomized and different, so you can't just memorize the numbers from book to book. So once each player, depending on the player count, has gotten their book, their color, has gotten their secret clue, and they know it, well, at that point, you can start playing. Now on the back of everyone's clue book are all the different types of possible clues that are in everyone's booklet. So there's a whole section of them that are basically two types of territories or terrains. So I might say like on forest or desert or on swamp, swamp or mountain. So if somebody has one of these types of clues, that person knows that that cryptid is in one of those two types of terrains. Uh, but so you, these are the, some of the things that you're going to be trying to rule in or out as you learn more about the other player's clues throughout the course of the game. Another types of clues is like when it, within one space of a terrain type or animal territory. So within one space of a forest, within one space of a desert, which by the way can mean actually in it because being in it is still within one space of it, or within uh, ter animal territories. Now there's also a legend at the bottom of your clue book. Cougar territories are these red ones with a cougar picture. Bears, black with the bear. You can see those right here. Uh, plus there's different uh, items. This uh, abandoned shacks are these triangles and standing stones are those big standing wood pieces. So the other types of clues are like within two spaces of either the standing stone or the abandoned shack, which are the pieces we just talked about, or within certain territories. And the last types of clues are within three spaces of a specific colored structure. So those, this would be you know, white, this would be green, things like that. So those are all the different possible clues that you, you can refer to, and those are the ones you're trying to rule in or out as you learn information about the other player's clues. So how do you learn information? Now that you know what you're trying to do, you're trying to basically find out which one of these exact clues the other players have. Because once you have those, and you know your secret one, then you can say where the cryptid is and win the game. Now in setup, once everybody has their clues, they'll end up putting out two cubes on the board. Anytime a cube is placed on the board, that means it does not match that player's secret clue. For example, this player, this red player, placed a cube here. This means that their clue could not be within one space of a desert or on a desert, for example. It also could not be within two spots of this standing structure. It also can't be within three spots of a white structure. So all those different clue types that we talked about on the back of the clues, you get to know those pretty well and you can start deducing things even from the beginning of the game. Turns are very simple. You only have two choices. Let's go over the first one. You're going to place this pawn marker on any region uh, and then you're going to ask any player a question. This is called questioning. And you're going to ask them, does this pass your clue or not? So let's say it was the red player's turn and they asked the orange player. 
then that orange player has two choices. They have to always tell the truth. If it does not pass their clue, meaning this can't be it, they place a cube there. Now, this tells us that this spot cannot be in that player's clue. So we know a lot of things right now, just off the first question. We know that it can't be in maybe uh, the forest. Maybe it's not one space within a desert or one space within a swamp. We know it's not three spaces from a green. We know it's not maybe a certain spaces from animal territories or standing stones or things like that. So there's all sorts of things that you can start to look at and try to start deducing. Now, when a player does place a clue, uh, a cube, the player that actually asked the question has to also place a cube. And it has to obviously not match their clue. So anytime you get a no answer from someone, you have to give a no answer to everybody by placing one of those on the board. So information comes out pretty quickly in the game. So that red player, let's say they place this and now they've learned something else. Everyone else now knows that it can't be within one space of a blue. And now they also maybe know this, you know, it's still not three spaces within the green, uh, but th they've learned a little bit, but this player is trying to give up the least amount of new information as possible. Then it just goes clockwise to the next player. Now, I told you one of the ways to do this is to place there and ask a question like that. And now what if this was correct? If this was correct, that player would place a disc just like that. And that tells everybody that this meets that player's clue. So what does that mean? Well, it could be on a forest, could be one space within a desert, could be one space within this, could be, you know, you start looking around and start thinking about what could it be, and you start ruling out all the things that it might not be. Um, also, uh, when you're uh, placing this, instead of placing your pawn and asking a question, you can place a pawn and you can try to search. And in this case, the player whose turn it is would actually place a disc like that. And then what happens is going clockwise, each player has to try to disprove it. Uh, if they disprove it, meaning this does not match their clue, they place a cube. And as soon as someone places a cube, that person's turn basically stops because they've disproved this. Because when you place the disc and you do what's called a search, you're trying to win the game. You think you're right. You're going to place this. If all the other players have to place a disc, that means all the player's clues are true to the spot, meaning you have found the cryptid and won the game. But if any player can disprove it in a clockwise order, well, your turn ends, but because someone placed a cube, you also have to give up more information. So again, you're either placing this and asking a question to somebody, or you're placing it with your own disc because it passes your clue, and you're trying to figure out, did you win the game? But you can still learn information, but you're also giving up a lot of information. Now, turns like this continue to go clockwise until someone has won the game. And again, that's by searching, placing your disc, and all the other players in clockwise motion also place discs, meaning, yep, it's true for all of our clues. Now, if you get stuck, depending on the amount of players, you can look at a clue. Let's say we were playing a three-player game. Everyone would look at the, the secret clues uh, for this number two there. And so on the rule book, we would look here. Number two says, no within three space clues. So we know that there's no one has a clue that says within three spaces of something. So you can just mark off all of those things in your brain. Speaking of marking things off, there's no deduction sheets that come in the game, even though the rules say to use some paper and take notes. So I've made my own deduction sheets, which basically has all the types of clues, and then each column is a person, and as you rule things out, you cross them off. Uh, and this makes the game amazingly better than just trying to remember everything or just to take notes. I will try to remember to place a link in the description of the video for this. I almost find the game to not even to be playable without this. I mean, you can play it, but it's not nearly as enjoyable. This is a much more enjoyable way to play the game. Uh, this is just something I made myself, but I highly recommend you use it because it really allows you to track everything in a more logical manner. Now, I told you the beginner game and the advanced game. The advanced game is a lot harder because number one, it uses all four colors of structures. Where in this game, we saw, you know, we saw the blue, the green, and the white types of structures. Uh, in this, the advanced games, there's all four of them. Also, you can get negative clues. So you might get clues that say, not within two spaces of a standing stone, or not on a swamp or a fountain. And you have to really deduce things a lot different from doing that. In fact, if you play an advanced game, you'll have to basically use two of those deduction sheets that I showed you, with one of them being regular clues and one of them being not on uh, you know, certain things. So that's, that's the advanced game. There's also a two-player variant that's not in the rules, but I'm told they're gonna put this up on the website. I contacted the designers about it and played it. Each player will actually play two uh, color, so that would be a four-player game. Uh, and then when you're placing things, uh, if, you pl if you have to place a cube of both colors, you choose which color to place. 
Um, and if you have to, if you have to place a disc of both, then you place them both. So some information gets confounded. There's a lot. There's actually a little bit more depth in the two-player game. So I wouldn't recommend playing two players for your first play. I'm not going to go in the detail of all the differences, but there is a two-player variant. It's excellent, but don't play it for your first game for sure. There is cryptid. Spoiler alert, I am in love with this game. I love deduction. Deductions is my favorite style of games, I'd say. And unfortunately, with as many thousands of games that come out every year, not too many of them are deduction. You see resource management, engine building, dice rolling, tactical card play. You see all this stuff over and over and over again. You don't often see deduction, and I don't know why. I wish there were more of them. Uh, so I love deduction games especially ones like this. This is streamlined deduction. I mean, and, I, and when I like deduction games, I like them streamlined. I don't like any Chrome wrapped up. I don't like deduction with worker placement. I don't like deduction with set collection. I like pure logic puzzle deduction. And that's what this gives you with actually some more stuff that I'll talk about later. Uh, but you basically have two choices. You're gonna ask a question to anybody you want, or you're going to try to solve it by searching. Very simple mechanisms. Uh, the replayability of this, wow, many different scenarios, I think like 50 something, close to 60 scenarios. Uh, it just, the, 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 the replayability is infinite. And so uh, that's really cool too. I love that it's deduction, but you have certain board play. Like you're trying to figure out where to go, uh, where to, who to ask, you're looking at the board, but you're also, you know, when you have to place a cube, you're looking on there going, huh, where should I place the cube? Where's gonna give everyone else the least amount of information? How can I confound as much, as much information as possible by placing this cube? Uh, and then when you're asking other players, you know, and you're trying to figure out where to ask, you're looking, you're thinking, you're like, what can I do that will help me cut this down in half? And it's just, you're looking at the board and it's just so awesome that it's, you know, most deduction games are like cards or this and that, like, but this is just like, you're using the spatial aspects of the board and the boards change every game. And it's just, it's just such a really cool idea to have that extra layer of depth in the game. I love the free questioning. Uh, you know, you get to ask which space and which person. And I love that flexibility because sometimes in deduction games, you got to ask the player to the left or you're very limited. Oh, you can ask, then sometimes it's like, well, you can ask any player, but you can only ask them one of those four things. Like one of my favorite deduction games, Sleuth is like that. And I love that game, but this gives you infinite flexibility by space and person. And man, it's, it's really good. It gives you a ton to think about. And I love that the decisions are so tough. It's like, okay, I want to ask this question to this person. Hmm. Do I want to do it so I can cut the, my, my options of what I, where I think their clue is in half. But in order to do that, if I'm wrong, then I'm going to have to place a cube and give more information out. Or should I ask them a question that I'm pretty sure they're going to say yes to and rule out less things, but then because they said yes, I don't have to put something out there and give out information. And you're like balancing this and it's just, it's, it's a thing of absolute design beauty, I would say. Uh, <laughs> so you're trying to do that. I like how, you know, when, when, when you're placing those cubes, you know, you, 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 you're giving hints, but you got to decide where to do that. Uh, I like that you're, uh, you, you know, in, in deduction games, one of the biggest complaints of all deduction games is if someone screws something up on their deduction sheet, it ruins the entire game. And it's just the nature of the beast. It's, it's you know, it's the, if you like logic puzzles, if someone messes up on their logic puzzle or gives you a wrong answer, you, you're hosed. Now in this, you could possibly still get hosed, but unlike most deduction games, you can actually recover from this. Where if someone realizes they've made a mistake, they can fix it on the board, they're penalized a little bit, they have to put some more cubes out, but they can fix it. And once it's fixed, it can get people back on track. In two different games that I've played this, three quarters of the way through, someone went, oh crap, I, I, I messed up, I'm so sorry. This was not supposed to be a cube, this was supposed to be a disc. One game, someone screwed up on two spots and they realized it at the same time, like, Oh no, this and this is wrong. And they put it there and we were all, uh, the game did end shortly after, but every, I, was, I was on one game and when someone else another game was able to still get the solution. That's amazing. There's not a lot of deduction games when someone screws up, if they catch it, that they can sort of keep the game going. Usually it's just dead. And that cannot be understated more, off, more than, than anything because I don't think I have any other deduction games that's this style of logic puzzle sheet deduction that you can do that in. And that's really cool. I love that aspect of it. I also love that if you get stuck, you can get a hint. Uh, there's that little one number, you can get a hint, it gives everyone a clue, keeps people going. Uh, really, really cool here. 
I also like that it has a two-player variant. Now, it's not in the rules, but it will be online. I've played the two-player variant, and I love it. Deduction games don't often play with two players. There are a few that I have in my collection that I absolutely love, and playing with two is awesome. And this allows you to do that, and it feels like the same game, but yet still it's a little bit differently and makes you think a little bit differently. Uh, because, you know, you can choose which cube to put down, and so someone might be going and, and placing the same cube over and over and over to, to keep the, the information separate from you, but if they end up having to place a disc of the other color, then they've given you a ton of information. So there's actually more depth even in the two-player game. Which is crazy. It's similar, but even more deep, and I love it. Uh, so, overall, this game is just... It, it really just blew my mind. I'm just... I'm in love with this game. Anything I didn't like about it? Yes! Absolutely things I didn't like about it. There were no deduction sheets. This game, when I played it without deduction sheets, it was intriguing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But it was just too hard. Too hard to remember everything. Too hard to look around. There were no deduction sheets. I made my own deduction sheets. In fact, if I remember, I'll try to put a link to those in the description of this video. And after playing with those deduction sheets, it took this game from intriguing to absolutely one of my favorite deduction games of all time. Uh, it is so good. So I wish they would have included deduction sheets. It's kind of a no-brainer here, especially in the rules where they said, well, you should take notes. Well, great. <laughs> uh, but the sheets just download the ones that I made and the game is infinitely better. Uh, I would have loved to have seen the shacks, which are just triangles, and the stones, which are just little, you know, pieces of wood. I would have loved to have seen them actually be shacks and be a stone that's colored. And I might actually go off and try to find some pieces to, 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 to soup my, my copy up. Uh, but it's a little bland the way it looks now. I would have loved to have seen them go just an extra mile on production here. It's not enough these days just to have an excellent game. It's, you've got to go over and beyond production-wise. I wish they would have done that with this. It would bring more people into it. Um, I would have liked to have seen like little no signs instead of cubes. Again, just a little production nitpick that would have made, taken this game to amazing to... It's already amazing. To even beyond that. Uh, and also, there's two colors in the game that are blue. There's like a light blue and a dark blue. And in average light conditions or worse, it's, it's really hard to tell them apart. And when you're deducing things, it could, like I said, it could kind of break the game for you. I don't know why they didn't choose a different color from blue. There's plenty of other colors maybe that they might have been able to use, but maybe not because of the colors on the board stuff. But I really wish they would have made them different. Um, but that's it. Those are my honest negatives. But I am in love with this game. Saxophone Serenade. Here it comes. It's coming into my gaming library. This has been the Game Boy Geek, helping you fight and enjoy the next board game you'll love. This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. Thank you.